a beautiful morning already it has been to gather together and worship in song. There's a lot of people, not just in the front lines, behind the scenes as well, that work hard to be able to lead us into worship in the Lord. And I appreciate them so much, from the AV team to the worship team, the greeters who welcome you at the front, there as you're coming in with a smile on their faces, just saying, so awesome to have you here. <clears throat> and thank you all for being here. As was said already, being together is a little taste of heaven on earth. And I can't wait. I mean, I love, um, and I'm going to do this as well during my message, but I love how um, Paul challenged us to <clears throat> picture us surrounding with millions, possibly even billions over the millenniums of other believers placing our crowns before the throne of God. And just trying to picture that in my mind's eye just was so powerful and so beautiful. And I'm going to invite you as well shortly during this message to also picture something else um, that John takes us into a scene in heaven. And wow, what a scene it is. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Lord, even though you've called me to come and teach and preach your word, I'm taking a step back. And I want you to be in front of me so that we would see you and hear your voice and know your heart. <clears throat> and Holy Spirit, I want you to be walking up and down the aisles and across the rows. Holy Spirit, just touching the hearts and minds of every one of us here and those who are watching at home as well. You know what they're going through. You know the joys and you know the challenges. And I pray that, Father, you would, through your Spirit, just minister to them. And also, Father, we've come through a great week here at this church with the summer camp. All of us have come through different kinds of weeks that we've had. And we're looking ahead at a week, Father, of all kinds of things we need to be doing or preparing for. And right now I pray and I ask you that you would just take all those kinds of other distractions away and help us focus on you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength being ready to receive what you have to teach us. Both words of encouragement and words of challenge as well. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so we are going through this summer series on the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. And last week we started with the first six verses in chapter 1, and we're going to go on with finishing off chapter 1. But before we get into verse Seven, I want to preface, I want to set the stage for what we're about to read in verse 7 with what Peter says in one of his letters. Come with me to 2 Ch Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, if you have your own Bibles, you have your phone, whatever it is, I'm reading from the New International Version or NIV for short. That's usually what I read from. If it isn't, then I'll let you know. Um, but it's from the NIV. It's also on the screen. Some of you are just more listeners, that's how you like to learn, or, so just listen to what I'm about to read as it sets the stage for the next verse we're going to look at in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through the apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. 
they will say, where is this coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it is since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, instead he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Now let's read verse 7 of chapter 1 in Revelation. And we read these words. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the peoples on the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples on the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Folks, followers of Jesus Christ, believers in Jesus Christ, we actually live with great hope and anticipation, with a great awareness and understanding that Jesus can return at any time. And his return will happen in two stages. Two stages we are told in Scripture. The first stage we call the rapture. That word rapture, that time, that season of the rapture will happen suddenly when believers, all of a sudden, true believers, true followers of Jesus Christ, would be lifted up and met up with Jesus up in the heavens. And Jesus will bring us, usher us in to heaven. This will take place, why? To protect us from what's about to happen. The most painful, trying, difficult, most evil season in the life of the people left behind. The Bible calls it the tribulation. Where the devil be riled to literally reign all over the earth. No holds barred. Utter destruction, unimaginable suffering. In essence, it's the full wrath of God is going to be on people who are left behind. But we are the ones rescued from the wrath of God. That's the rapture. If you want to read about that, you can read about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 13 to 18. And if you want to understand the full wrath of God that's going to happen on those who are left behind, read Revelation chapter 6 all the way to chapter 20. That's the first stage. The second stage of Christ's return is what's going to be called judgment, judgment day. This is recognized as the full second coming of Jesus Christ. For as lightning is visible from the east, and the west, so will the whole earth see Jesus come down. The sun will be darkened, moon will not give its light, stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken, and the sun will come down from the clouds of heaven, and all the world will see him. Every person will see him, and all people will be brought before God's throne of judgment, and those whose names are written in the book of life will be brought into the new heaven and the new earth, and those whose names are not on the book of life will be sh shut down, shut into eternity in hell. The Bible also describes it as a lake of fire. If you want to read more about that, it's Matthew chapter 24, verse 27 to 31, and Revelation 20, verse 11 to 15. So both Peter's words that we just read and verse 7 here in Revelation 1 speaks of not the rapture, but the full second coming of Jesus Christ. And during those seven years of tribulations is what Peter is talking about, where they're going to be making fun of the crowds, 
that believes and says, where is the second coming? No, he's not going to come. Wait a minute. I thought all believers will be rescued in the rapture. During the tribulation, the Bible speaks of still people will come to know Jesus, Savior, and Lord, will recognize him as the true Messiah. And from my understanding of Scripture, those people will be the Jews that have been left behind. That's why Peter talked about those who are scoffing them, saying, hey, ever since our ancestors died, where is this second coming? And they'll mock him. And now some of us might scratch our heads and wonder, wait a minute, after a billion plus people, whoever knows how many people, but if there's eight billion people on this earth, I would hope at least a billion people are true believers in Jesus Christ, if not more. After a billion people are just suddenly taken up in the rapture, how is it possible that the people who are left behind still shake their heads and go, no, 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 no. Jesus didn't take them up. What are they going to, in essence, credit this rapture to? What are they going to credit this rapture to? This massive disappearance of people all of a sudden. What are they going to credit it to? Here's my theory. My theory is this. Is that they're going to credit this massive differ, di disappearance of people to aliens abducting them. You laugh. But that's my theory. In fact, if you look online, I just did a quick research, percentage of people believe in aliens. It was an American statistic. How many Americans percentage do you think believe aliens actually exist? Give me a percentage. 33%. Huh? 60, 90. You were the closest. 65% of Americans believe that aliens exist. And I would hazard a guess that even some Christians in that 65% would believe there's life on other planets. So you're going to have this seven years of tribulation that's going to be happening. And then John proclaims that when Jesus returns the second time, that judgment time, John says all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. This is not a mourning of repentance. This is a mourning that's more as a beating of the chest, recognizing that it's over with them. They know what they're going to hear from God. It's too late. All they're going to face is judgment. It's a beating of the breast of utter anguish. So as believers, as believers, we have such tremendous hope and anticipation for that day whenever it's going to happen. It can happen on a Sunday morning. It can happen any time when we will be raptured up, saved from the ultimate wrath of God, that seven years of tribulation. But as believers, we should have this aching burden, passionate burden, praying and crying out and using every opportunity possible to witness to others so that they too will not experience the tribulation but will be raptured up. And we do it out of love. I meet somebody in my church. Uh, it's somebody that's contract work for our church. And they come every few months. And uh, we love to sit down and chat in my office for a little while. Before God goes and does his work around the church. It's not a church goer or anybody. It's just, I guess, somebody from the city does contract work here. And we're just talking about everything under the sun this past week. We were talking about the Trump and Biden debate. <laughs> we were talking about um, his holidays, my holidays coming up, all kinds of stuff. Then we were talking about the stuff that's going on in the world and the wars and the nations that are battling against Israel, which is so, I was telling him, so prophetic, so biblical. And I've invited him so many times to come to church. And he said, I will, I will, I will. And he says, sometimes I see your stuff on, posted on social media and stuff. And it's pretty cool. And this week I said to him, I said to him, I'm just going to call him Bill, change his name. I said, Bill, 
I need you to know this one thing. That Jesus will come back at any moment. And I shared with him again the gospel message. And I said, you know, Bill, why I'm telling you this. Because of my love for you. I want you to be where I'm going to be. You know that, don't you? He says, yes, I know you're doing it out of love. I shared this story, and he said afterwards, okay, and you know what? <laughs> My background is Catholic, and where can I get a Bible? I said, well, guess what? <laughs> we have Bibles to give to you for free. And I told him, ripped it open. I told him, start with the book of John. And ask yourself the question, what are you learning about Jesus Christ? I shared this story with you because he knew why I was passionately just urging him to take this seriously, what Jesus offers us. He knew because I love him. And so out of that love, we also should share the good news with others. Then we get to verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I am the Alpha and the Omega, number one. Number two, who is and was and who is to come. Number three, the Almighty. Here, God is revealing three significant names and character, his nature in this one verse. Why is he doing that? Because he's removing all doubt that all that he's said thus far, all that he's about to say, and all that you're going to keep reading about the future, everything, guess what? Because of who I am, it's actually going to happen. You can believe it. You can trust it. This will actually happen. Let's dig in with these names for a moment. God is the Alpha and the Omega. This is the first letter of the alphabet, the Greek alphabet, and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. In essence, what God is saying here is that he is the source of all things, and he is the end of all things. Everything that ever existed, everything that exists at the end of all time, is all because of God. He's the beginning and the end. This is possible. Why? Because God always exists. He is the eternal one. If there was another God before him, then that's the God. And if there's another God before him, then that's the God. There can't be an infinite regression of creation. There's got to be ultimately a creator who created all things. It's a philosophical argument. There cannot be an infinite regress. And he is the creator of all things. He always existed. Or he could not be God. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Secondly, we are told that he is, he is, was, and is to come. God, yes, is eternal. That's what it means in the second one. But also what it means, what it's referring to is, here's a big word, God's immutability. Anybody know what that word means? His unchangeableness. He never changes. He will never change his mind. You're not going to read the Bible and second guess that what he says is going to happen and go, oh, wait a minute, he might change his mind. No, he never changes his mind. He never changes. He is God back then, now, and into the future. So we can trust what we're reading, that what he says is going to happen is actually going to happen. That's why we read that in verse 8. It's just, what a way to start off this whole book of Revelations. And there's still so much more. I mean, then he's going to give the messages to the seven churches that we're going to start looking at next week. And in essence, when he says that I will never change, the message I'm giving to the seven churches back then is a message for us today. And then finally, we read God is almighty. In other words, God is God and I am not. 
God is God. He is the all-powerful being over all creation. He has the authority. He has the power to accomplish what he says he's going to accomplish. And the world someday will recognize this, and every knee will bow and acknowledge that he is God, the Bible says. Therefore, knowing all these truths about Jesus' second coming, knowing all these truths about the character and the nature of our God and his power and authority, the question we must ask ourselves, then how ought we to live on this earth? How ought we to respond to such an awesome God? How? Well, let's not wait till we see him face to face and worship him. Uh -uh -uh -uh. Let's worship him as he rightfully deserves today. Let's give him, as we're calling this year, the enthusiastic worship that he rightfully deserves. And that worship includes the four things that we've talked about a few times, the four areas in our lives that we should be worshiping him, worshiping him in our hearts. Worshiping him in our hearts, what does that mean? Well, there's lots of things I've already talked about. For example, we ought to live holy and blameless lives. You've heard me say it before. I've talked to so many parents, and I bet you if I asked you as parents or grandparents, and I say, what do you hope for for your children and for your grandchildren, whatever it is, most people will say, I just, I just want them to be happy. Bible does mention happiness. In fact, Jesus says to those of us who are going to meet him face to face, job well done, good and faithful servant, come enter your master's happiness. Nothing wrong with happiness, but the goal of our life is holiness. Holiness. This changes everything. I'm going to give a few examples of that later on in my message and as we prepare as well for partaking in communion. So we worship in our hearts by living a holy and blameless life. We also will worship in our hearts by trusting and obeying him. And we also worship him with our treasure. For the Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How are you handling your finances? Is it all just for you? Or do you recognize that God has blessed us with the finances and to use it to build his kingdom here on earth and store up treasures in heaven? So we worship in our hearts. How else do we worship? And we worship in our homes and in our world. How do we worship in our homes and our world? Well, simply stated, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Be that example at home, especially if you're a father and you're a husband. That is the greatest responsibility we have is to lead by example to our spouses, to our wives, and to our children of what it looks like to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. That also means, therefore, not only loving one another in the home, loving your neighbor. In essence, that's how we worship in the world. If we love our neighbor, we're going to tell them about Jesus. We're going to love them like Jesus. We're going to serve them like Jesus, care for them like Jesus, have fun with them like Jesus, whatever it may be. And we also worship in our gathering by singing, by singing. Oh, folks, do you know what an amazing worship experience is going to be in heaven when millions, if not billions of people with one voice are worshiping God? Well, let's experience a little taste of that here on earth where with one big voice we are worshiping God as he rightfully deserves, not mumbling the words, but worshiping with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. When we're gathering together, we're worshiping with thanksgiving in our hearts, with praises. God deserves much more than dull and apathetic worship. He deserves enthusiastic worship, not just on Sunday morning, but taking it out throughout the rest of the week. So let's not wait till we get to heaven to worship him as he rightfully deserves and every knee will bow, but let's do it here on earth. And now, this is where I'm going to ask you to once again try to picture something in your mind's eye. For you see, John is about to encounter Jesus 
face to face. And he does a masterful job of doing the best that he can with the limitations of language in itself to describe this Jesus that he's seeing. And I'm going to read it slowly so that you can try to picture in your mind's eye what Jesus looks like in this scene. And then you'll understand why the only way that John could respond was though as if he was dead, unconscious, fell before such an awesome, awesome scene. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing water. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. What a sight. And whatever we try to picture in our mind's eye, whatever vision you've got before you right now, oh, it will pale in comparison to reality when we do see him someday face to face. There's a song that is sung by Mercy Me, I believe it is. I can only imagine. And their lyrics speak of this questioning, self-questioning of what will I do when I see my Savior? Will I run to him and give him a hug? Will I fall on my knees and worship him? I think when we see this kind of a sight, we'll be so blown away. I think it's going to be the latter. We're going to fall on our knees and worship him. And then get up and give him a hug. (laughs) Because he is our friend as well. Now what Jesus says next in verse 17 and 18, get ready for this, because I'm going to give you some information on how you can totally rattle Jehovah's Witnesses that come to your door. For you see, the Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus is divine. They don't believe that Jesus is God. They believe that he is a son of God. But what I'm going to give you right now Starting with Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. You can write this down if you want on your phone, pen and paper, whatever it is. What, how I'm gonna, what I'm going to teach you is how you can navigate through a very short conversation with them that will leave them speechless to realize the error of their way they've been taught, the lies they've been taught by their false teachers. I'll say it point blank. And I've had some that says, oh, um, we got to go back and talk with our, I think they call them elders, but forgive me if it's the wrong thing. And, and we'll get back to you. How many of them came back to my house? Any guesses? None. <laughs> None. Yes. Ready? And this works with anybody. Anybody who doubts the divinity of Jesus Christ. So you start off with Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. Isaiah 44, verse 6. And I read them this verse. They can read it for themselves as well. And it says this. This is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer, 
the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. And so I simply ask, as we look at this verse right in their Bibles, who is this passage speaking of? Who is speaking actually in this passage? Not speaking of. Who is actually speaking in this passage? Who? No, not Jesus. Let's not say X equals A all the time in math. Uh, always the answer is Jesus. No, who's speaking? Jehovah God. Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah God. This is God. This is the Lord Almighty, God, creator of the universe. That's what they're going to say. And they're going to say, absolutely. You're absolutely right. This is God of the universe, the creator God, Jehovah. You're right. Okay, now remember that. And I want to take you now to Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. And I want to ask you, please tell me who is speaking in this passage. I'm going to ask them this question. Who is speaking in this passage? And I read from Revelation 1, 17, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. If they go back to Isaiah 44, 6, it said, I am the first and the last, which is God. And so they read this passage, I am the first and the last. Who is speaking this passage? It is God. Jehovah, the creator of the universe. And I say, absolutely, you're right. It's the same God as in Isaiah. And then I say, okay, we're going to read the next verse now, 18. And let's look and see what else God says about himself. What else does God say about himself? I'm the living one. I was dead and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. This is where they are stunned to silence. And then after a moment, I ask them, which God do we know of that lived? that died and that is now alive, rose again forever and ever. Which God? Anybody? Now you can say his name. Jesus. The divinity of Jesus is an absolute historical, biblical, and theological fact. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the only one capable of saving the humanity, the human race from all of their sins. He is the only one who is both God and man that is capable of standing in our place, receiving the judgment for our sins, and thereby having the authority and the power to forgive us of our sins, make us right with God the Father, and enter into his presence forever and ever and ever. Only Jesus. And Jesus' resurrection proves his victory over death and also his authority of all who receive salvation so that we will not be stuck in hell forever. This is why Jesus can confidently assert that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And this is why Luke can assert in his book of Acts that there's no other name under heaven by which man can be saved. No other name but the name of Jesus. So what are you going to do with Jesus? And in the final two verses in chapter 1, 19 and 20, Jesus says these words right there, for what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches themselves. There are three parts to this unveiling, apocalypse, this unveiling this revelation of what was once a mystery. There's three parts to it. There is the part of what has just been seen, which is chapter 1. John lets us know all that. 
And then he says, what is now, which will be chapters 2 and 3, the letters to the seven churches, and the letters for us today, what is now, and then what is to come, which is all chapters 4 through 22. There's three parts. And we're also told that each church has an angel assigned to it. We're going to talk a little bit more about angels next week, but let me suffice to say this. It's such a beautiful and reassuring and encouraging promise that there's angels assigned to the churches. And what are angels? Hebrews 1.14 lets us know angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Psalm 103, 20 to 21 tells us angels are mighty who do God's bidding and obey his will. And Psalm 91, 11 tells us that angels are commanded by God to guard us in all our ways. Folks, you got to love and appreciate how God chooses to start off this phenomenal book, the last book of the Bible, the last book of all of history. It's filled with words of encouragement and reassurance as one verse after another we are reminded over and over again of this awesome God that we worship, that we ought to enthusiastically worship. So let me summarize as we prepare ourselves to take communion what we've learned from last week to this week. He is the one and only true God, and there are none beside him. And there's no other gods beside him. God was and is and always will be the true ruler who is sovereign over all. And we are blessed to be on the receiving end of his grace and of peace and of his love so that we who have been forgiven of his sins by the blood of Jesus Christ have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness and brought into his kingdom. But also not only that, we are his kingdom and his priests, which I said last week has significant implications on the way we treat one another. For the way we treat one another ought to be the way we treat Christ. For Christ is in us. He's also supreme and sovereign ruler over all. So when he says what's going to happen will actually happen. You can trust it. You can believe it. And the question was, whose side are you going to be on? And until that day when we are brought into his presence, when every knee will bow, should we not therefore worship him as he rightfully deserves here on earth? And our Lord has blessed the churches with his angels to be ministering to us and serving.